if we needed rain, it rained. <laughs> if, if we didn't need rain, it didn't rain. If we wanted a cloudy atmosphere with the meth people, it, we had a cloudy atmosphere with the meth people. I mean, it was fascinating. We, we, we hardly would talk about it because we thought, watch out, this is something will happen, there'll be a cyclone. How, how long was the shoot? Uh, almost six weeks. And where is the movie played? It's got wonderful reviews, so how is it being received? I, it's, it's fabulous. Uh, people, I don't know, they're very touched by it. Uh, and, and that's so nice, uh, I think. I was, I, I was interested in how maybe they might react. Uh, critics, you know, because sometimes they, if something is warm and cuddly and sweet or whatever, they, they have to be rude to it. But not, not at all. They're actually being very nice, <laughs> kind, and uh, uh, so on. But you're wonderful in the film. You're in every scene just about. Is that difficult? I mean, there's almost like maybe one or two scenes that you're not in it. Is that hard to carry? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you must understand, right. I, I'm a theater actress. I do thousands of plays, right. and, and uh, so it's, it's, it's normal for me. Right. I, I, the last play I did, which was the last play that Tennessee Williams ever wrote, um, it was the longest part that he'd written, including Blanche, which I had done in the theater as well. Um, and uh, my kids were at that stage where if I forgot something, um, they would say, well, Mom, you know, you, you're forgetting this, you're, you're doing that. And so I made all three of my daughters and my sons-in-law come to this play. And I said, okay, I don't want anyone ever to say again that I'm forgetting things. <laughs> this is the longest part I've ever done. Which play was that? Which play was that? It was, oh, it was fascinating. It's called, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, stop. It's, 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 it's just, it, it's, um, masks, outrageous, and obs obscure. And it was the most bizarre thing he ever wrote, I was, but it was fabulous. It was a great part. Right. And you love doing theater. We, we, you were on my radio show. We discussed that I read that you said if you're in a part in a, in a play, you, want, you have to be the lead. And in a movie, you'll take a secondary role. In television, you would take a secondary role. But tell people why you want to be the lead in the play. Well, it would be boring. You know, if you're, if you're doing a play, I'm playing a small part. I, 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 and there's not enough time. You know, July 5th, mm -hmm. I'm going to be 78. Wow. So I've got a lot of stuff I've got to do really quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to hurry up. Right. <laughs> so, You're in the right place but, around here. <laughs> but in this film, in, in Red Woodock, who is Marie? How did you, what did you think? Who, who is Marie? Well, I think she is a person who is suffering uh, because she lost the person that she loved um, at a very in a violent way, and um, she is unable to. Uh, she's unable to let it go, um, and I think it's colored. Her whole life, and she <coughs> since she lost him, and so she's trying very hard um, to be stronger. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's very difficult. I know um, a lot of you probably have lost your loved ones, and I lost my husband, and um, I I know that for myself. Um, for example, I'm absolutely fine all day long. I'm absolutely fine. The times when I get sad and uh, lonely are first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of the time, I, I'm able to function and so on. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's her. And also, 
as a result of her anger, I think, at, at having lost her um, husband, she made some very bad choices, which her son points out. Um, so I think her, when she says at the end of the film, I had to do this, I had to walk. And obviously, she had to go through where she was uh, with her husband, you know, at, at, the, at the campsite and at the place where she, um, their, their honeymoon. And, and I think, for me, the, the thing that happens to her as a result of experiencing the death of the place where she was, you know, the, the awfulness of the, of the campsite and the horror of the, of the um, uh, motel where they had their honeymoon, that somehow that is kind of, um, she realizes how precious moments are that are not filled with anxiety and heartbreak and upset and um, anyway. <laughs> now, towards the end of the film, uh, your character Marie, you see the you see into the future. You see your granddaughter mm -hmm. happily married with two children, yes. and that's Tom, your ex-husband, showing you. Is that quote hocus pocus, or are we supposed to just, <laughs> you know, remember the bartender kept saying, "Do you believe in hocus pocus?" Mm -hmm. You know, I've always been a person who was like, oh, poo-poo things, you know, <laughs> like that. And um, I, I think I'm able to share a story and you won't think that I'm a cuckoo bird. <laughs> um, two nights before my husband died, there was a bird in our front garden singing in the middle of the night, it was like one in the morning, and woke us up, and, he, and John said, um, my husband was British, um, John said, gosh, that, that sounds like a nightingale, and we were living in California at that time. I said, I don't think they have many nightingales here. Uh, so that happened one, two nights before he died, and then it happened the night before he died. And then the day that he died, that night, um, we were all sitting in, in the living room, and the bird starts singing again. It's like the third night. And I said, you know, that's so interesting, because the past two nights, um, that bird has been singing in the middle of the night. And uh, so we all went outside, and we couldn't find the bird anywhere. And um, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Sophie, said, Mom, let's record that. And she got out a tape recorder, and um, she said, bird singing, and um, that was it. And the next morning, I pushed the button to play it, and she said, bird singing, and there was no bird singing. It was blank. It was nothing. And so that night, again, the bird was singing. and. I said, Sophie, you know, it didn't work. Uh, it didn't record. I heard you say bird singing, but that was it. She said, oh, you must have done something. So she did it again, and again the next morning, uh, there, the bird was not singing. So, and then the next night, he uh, was gone. It was gone. So two nights, before my husband died, the night he died, and two nights after. Now, I don't know what that was about, um, but there are people who would say, well, um, that is someone coming for him, or whatever, whatever, whatever. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. Well, I believe in all of that. <laughs> yeah, somebody well, was visiting. Know, I, I think if things, if something exists, it exists. You know, there's some reason why we have all kinds of right. stuff well, happen. <laughs> well, let's go back. You were born in Kansas. I was and, born in Kansas. And you Kansas. wanted to be an opera singer. 
That's correct. So what happened? <laughs> well, what happened is um, I, I probably am one of the people um, that was raised in the smallest town on the planet. Um, uh, we lived in uh, a town of 13 houses. Uh, we had um, a two-room schoolhouse. I, when I went to first grade, it was only me and Donnie Ray Hall. <laughs> and, um, um, Mrs. Rhodes taught one through four, and Mr. Rhodes taught five through eight. <laughs> it's a small uh, community of, of uh, wheat farming, mostly. Um, and of course, this is before television, and our, uh, I only saw three movies as a child uh, until I went to high school, because we were like 20 miles away from a town that had a movie theater. So we were taken to see as a special treat Bambi and Wizard of Oz, and a movie my mom wanted to see with Betty Grable and June Aver, which I loved. It was a musical, and it was about uh, bro uh, um, vaudeville performers, and they sang and they danced, and most <coughs> of all, they wore extraordinarily beautiful clothes that I'd never seen anything like it before, and I begged my mother to buy the paper dolls. They used to make paper <laughs> dolls out of all those movies. <laughs> and anyway, I'm, I mentioned that because life is very fascinating to me sometimes. And when I did the film Sweet Bird of Youth, I was told by Richard Brooks, the director, to go and see the costumer and it, I went to see the costumer, and it was Ori Kelly. And I knew who he was, because on the back of the paper dolls, it said, Costumes by Ori Kelly. Now, I couldn't have cared less to meet Paul Newman and everybody else in the but to meet this man who made those clothes. So I said, of course, like an idiot, I said, oh, oh Mr. Kelly, I, 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 I had the paper dolls, blah, 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 you know? And he sort of patted me on the head, and he said, he said and he had this accent, I think it was Hungarian, and he said, well, you're going to be very happy because I'm going to make you a white dress out of handkerchiefs, which he did. <laughs> and you were nominated for an Academy Award in that movie. I was, yes. Yeah. So when you grow up in a little town like that, do you have dreams of leaving? I mean... Oh, I always knew I would leave. And I thought I was going to be an opera singer. Um, and uh, anyway, w w going back to that, uh, we listened to the opera every Saturday, my, my grandfather, my mother, and myself. And my, my mother's side of the family were very musical. My grandfather played the cello, and, and we sang in church, and I played the piano, and my sister played the violin, and you know, I mean, we, that was our, uh, I don't know, our entertainment. Sure. And I just wanted to, to be an opera singer at the Met. And, I wanted to see an ocean. That was, you know, I, when you live 1,500 miles from an ocean, <laughs> you really want to see an ocean. <laughs> and I ended up, um, uh, between my junior and senior year at university in Wichita, Kansas, I um, took a class. I, uh, my parents let me go. I'd read about it uh, in a, a paper, because I, uh, not a paper, but a magazine. There was a. I worked um, to help put myself through school for a, a woman who was an editor, a society editor at the Wichita Beacon. And they got magazines, and they got a magazine. It was called Theater Arts Magazine, and in it, there you could go to Pasadena, California, and it was two hundred dollars, and you could have a six-week course in acting. And I thought, oh, I've got to know how to act. Uh, for my singing, and at that time, there was no such thing as acting taught in universities, and now it's crazy. <laughs> but um, 
In fact, my daughter is head of the musical theater department at Texas University. Anyway, um, she was a Broadway and opera star. Uh, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, so I go, and my mom puts me on the train in Wichita, uh, no, in Hutchison, on the Atchison, Topeka, on the Santa Fe. <laughs> And I go to LA and I get on a train to Pasadena. And the first weekend, I got on a train down Santa Monica Boulevard. And guess what I saw? The yeah. yeah. ocean. <laughs> so, uh, but I still was not going to be an actor. It just happened that somebody saw me because in the school we did a, a play, The House of Bernarda Alba. I didn't understand that I had any talent at acting and I wasn't even interested in it. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously I, you know, she, I played the one who hangs herself and is sad and cries all the time. And I go, oh, this is easy. <laughs> I'm just, piece of cake. Piece of cake. And somebody saw me and uh, took me to Warner Brothers. I was offered a contract and um, it happened, I looked like 15. I was 19, but I looked 15. <laughs> I looked like a skinny little rat with thick glasses. And um, anyway, uh, after I was there for a bit, they uh, said, there's, sent me over to Delbert Mann, the director, and they, um, he yeah, offered me the part of Weenie Flood, in the dark at the top of the stairs, and I was nominated. And also, exactly. <laughs> that was my first. And that was your big, that was your big break, right? That Into was my big break. Yeah. Yes, and um, I was laughing, but the other day because um, they did the the um, people who do the Golden Globes, the, for, the, the foreign, foreign press, the foreign press. Um, there was a photograph someone found of me online, you know how they find all these ancient things, <laughs> from 1958. And it was me and Bob Hope uh, at the Deb Star Ball, which they stopped doing. They only did it for a little bit. And, and um, they, you, I was the Deb Star for Warner Brothers. And Yvette Mimeo was the Deb Star for uh, 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 no, uh, MGM. And uh, anyway, uh, we. What happened is, it was basically that they they dolled us all up and fixed our hair, and and Warner Brothers loaned me a gown, and we walked down this big staircase. It was like the like the the uh, you know. Blah, blah, blah. Coming and, out, uh, debutantes coming out. Yeah, well, no, like you know. Um, Miss America. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Brian. Uh, and so we walked down this long staircase in your gown, and you stood. I keep doing that. I'm sorry. Um, and you stood next to Bob Hope. And he said, so you're Shirley Knight, and you're from Kansas, <laughs> and you're here for Warner Brothers, and blah, blah, blah. It's like that's, absurd. That's but this ancient photograph. We were, we're going to ask, the, anybody in the audience have questions? Oh, I, I do. This, now you, this, I get to run around like uh, Phil Donahue. Oh, bye. <laughs> Hi, Shirley. I'm the movie gal from Palm Springs, and I have, I have a, a question. Well, it's two part. First of all, have you ever thought of writing an autobiography? Because I think you have a wonderful story, and I think a lot of people would like to read about your life. You know, my children are keep saying that, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. But I am doing something really silly. I am doing a one-woman show about my life. And I'm singing like a couple of opera things, and I'm uh, I am having a wheel, kind of like a wheel of fortune, and I'm putting uh, all these things that I'm going to talk about on it, <laughs> like whether it's Richard Burton or you know whoever, uh, people I've worked with and funny stuff, and then the audience, somebody from the audience comes and they spin the wheel and whatever comes up it's going to be really fun, funny and then I'm also going to do a rant in it 
because I'm very political. And so Chris Durang is going to write the rant. So, <laughs> do you know who he is? You do. Yeah. Okay. And my second question was, um, you've worked with some really incredible leading men. And I was wondering if you could just give us little tidbits about them, like Paul Newman, Richard Burton. Sure. <laughs> well, first of all, Richard, um, Richard Burton, <laughs> we did this terrible movie together. It was called Ice Palace. And it was written by Edna Ferber. And she obviously was not a fool, because when she sold um, Giant to Warner Brothers, she said, oh, you, you have to buy my new book, uh, Ice Palace. <laughs> now, in Ice Palace, which I'm sure none of you saw, for example, I run away with an Eskimo. <laughs> <laughs> and we are out in the tundra, and I give birth, and I die, but Richard and his, the man that he hates most in the world get together to try to save me, uh, Robert Ryan, and um, the, the Eskimo has saved the baby because he kills a caribou and puts the baby in it. Now, <laughs> This is a really bad movie. <laughs> I mean, you know. So, we had about a month uh, where it was just Richard and I up there because we had this big scene, you know, with the, the Eskimo and all that. And um, so he, we became uh, such friends. It was one. He was like he was like. A, I mean, he was playing my father, and and he was kind of like a dad to me. But the main thing that happened with him is that he taught me Shakespeare, and it was amazing for me wow. because I really didn't know much Shakespeare. I wasn't uh, versed in it at all, and it encouraged me to do um, Juliet which wow. I did, and, and, um, and then Richard was doing um, uh, Hamlet on Broadway and asked me to do Ophelia, and I couldn't because I was doing um, Three Sisters with Geraldine Page and, and uh, so on. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I loved him, and he is, apart from my husband who also had this quality, who, my husband was Welsh uh, as well, Richard Burton could charm anything. <laughs> I mean, this model. Uh, dirt on the floor. <laughs> it, he would walk into a room and, and everybody goes, <coughs> I mean, just, you know, a kind of, a, 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 it's extraordinary that, yeah. um, that thing. <laughs> What about Paul Newman? You became good friends with Paul, Paul Newman. Paul, oh gosh, I miss him so much. Anyway, Paul, when I first met him, we were doing um, Sweet Bird of Youth, and uh, we were going to rehearse on the set, uh, the love scene, and I was there, and Joanne was sitting off to the side knitting, and she was very pregnant. She was about to have uh, her second child, I think it was, and um, so we were talking, and I said to her, I said, you know, do you have any advice, because it was only my second film, you know, and she said, yes, learn to knit. <laughs> and, and, you know, it sounds silly, but no. boy, is it good advice, <laughs> because you sit around a lot. You know, I have, I crochet, I'm not good at knitting. <laughs> I crochet and I can't tell you how many afghans I've made for people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and scarves. <laughs> you know. um, anyway, so Paul comes up and introduces himself. And he says, Shirley, listen, you know, we have to work on this love scene. So I think what we should do is go back there behind the, the uh, curtains over there and smooch a bit and get to know each other. <laughs> I turned scarlet. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and Joanne says, Paul, 
<laughs> Shirley doesn't know you very well. <laughs> And you became good friends, right? You stayed friends? Very, very good friends. We lived near each other in Connecticut. And, you know, Who else has a question? Oh, okay, right up here. I'll come back to you. What actually did happen to your singing career, and did you ever apply that singing in any of your roles? You know, not really. I, uh, the only thing I've done, uh, I've done a few um, concerts. Um, and that's been fun, but you know the thing about singing <laughs> is that it's not like acting. You really have to work your instrument every day, and so it, it, it's it, it, it's hard. Mm -hmm. However, my middle daughter uh, <coughs> did an opera at, at, in Paris and also at Lincoln Center, so it's kind of amazing. And also, she's a, you know, uh, Caitlin is a mezzo, and I'm a light soprano, and frankly, light sopranos are a dime a dozen. <laughs> and when I first, when I was at the early stage, when I was in, came to California, um, Maria Colas was giving a concert, and I went, and I sat there, um, and although in Kansas I was really important with my singing, and I won, you know, those state contest things and all that, I looked at her and I said, I will never be that good. Never. And I kind of consciously said, whatever I do, uh, I thought, I mean, I also like to write, so thought about that, but whatever I do, I know one thing. I want to be really, really, really good at it. And so I kind of, kind of gave it up. There's a question over here. Yes, uh, I'd like to know what your favorite role was and what director you liked the most and maybe the one who was the hardest on you and I have to tell you, I grew up in Hutchinson, Kansas. Oh my God! That's like 30 miles from me. I, oh, I know. You know, I went to high school in Lyons. So oh you know, my gosh. Yeah. Well, I got out of there and got to New York. <laughs> Score! <laughs> oh my goodness. Fabulous. So favorite director? There's a couple. Uh, the, my favorite director, in terms of theater, is Lucian Pentoli. He's a Romanian, um, and he l had to leave Romania when the Ceausescu's were being doing their horror. And um, we did the Cherry Orchard together at the arena stage, and I have never worked with someone um, that was so inventive and just little bitty things like for example, in the first act when uh, I say, I, th I think I see my mother in the orchard, and Chekhov says that I go outside, that she goes outside and then she comes back in and she says, it was nothing. Well, what he did with that moment, just that little moment, is I run out and I say, Mama, Mama, and he had prepared two barrels of cherry blossoms and I grabbed one in each hand and came back on stage and I was wearing this beautiful sort of pink uh, gown, not but not a, a for bed, you know. Um, and I came back in and I opened my arms in that huge arena stage, I opened my arms and said, it wasn't her, it was nothing. Mm -hmm. And those cherry blossoms went all over this huge uh, arena stage. And years later, I was doing uh, an event, uh, events when I were doing an event with uh, Hillary Clinton, and she was with this senator, and he said, excuse me, but aren't you the woman with the cherry orchard. I said, yes. And he said, 
if I live to be a hundred, I will never forget the cherry blossoms. And I thought, oh, gosh, you know, it's like we did one of the uh, disaster films together, Juggernaut. Which, which is memorable to me because I wore the most gorgeous white silk gown. <laughs> so. right. Any directors you would not want to work with again? <laughs> well, there was one at Warner's, um, and he was just mean, and you know he wasn't any good either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he was mean. <laughs> Who else has a question? Thank you. You got it, kid. I, I love your performance. It, it kind of reminded me of uh, Geraldine Page in Return to Bountiful. And did you have, gather any inspiration from that performance for this movie? Oh, well, um, you know, I've worked with Geraldine, of course, in, in Sweet Bird, but also we did uh, The Three Sisters on Broadway with Kim Stanley and directed by uh, Lee Strasberg. Um, and Geraldine was a very <coughs> amazing, amazing actress. Um, and she taught me so much, uh, both at the actor studio and, and when we did um, Three Sisters. One night, I, we'd done a matinee, and that night I fell into, I was young and not, um, as clever as I am now, and um, I, I um, that evening I fell into the trap of trying to do what I'd done in the afternoon because it was good, and I then I went off. It was awful, and, and I tried to copy it. I mean, it was very good, and I tried to copy it, and which made it awful. And uh, I went off stage, and I was crying because I was so upset with myself. And Geraldine came up to me and she said, you know what happened, don't you? And I said, no, I don't, it was horrible. I don't, I don't, I don't. And she says, this is what you have to do. You have to always remember that everything that is in your heart and your soul and everything about you is always available. And you don't have to work for it because it's already there. You just have to be in the moment and live the moment. And that was an extraordinary lesson for me. Because it, it, one of the things about acting is that people have a tendency to, I don't know, uh, I worry sometimes actually, and at the moment there's a lot of it for some reason. Um, there. They're afraid to just be, and instead they're acting rather than just being. Well, and trusting that you're enough. You know, when I when I when I teach, I I say things like, "Listen, unless you have an identical twin, you're the only one of you." in the world, so that makes you special. So you don't have to try to put something on, you know, and impose stuff on the material. Let the material speak to you. And I try. <laughs> you just said you, just say you teach, you teach acting. I try, I try to as much as I can. Can I, everybody be taught to act? Or no. Have, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, first of all, why would you want to? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think you have to be nuts. Uh, uh, um. <laughs> there has to be talent there. There has to be. You have to be nuts, but you have to have talent, talent. right? Yeah. Well, yes, yes, and and sometimes you can't you can't teach somebody if they're not. Open. You have to be open and um, willing to uh, willing to just open.
their heart and soul and everything, and not be ashamed, because a lot of acting is arrogance. You, you know, it's a lot of acting is, is uh, I can do that, <laughs> whatever it is, okay, I can do it. Um, and and uh, it's, it's what Lee Strasberg used to call the shams, which is that to get to the last, first you have to be, you have to have a relaxation. And then you have to have concentration. And then you have to have imagination. And then you have to have inspiration. But you, though, that's the steps to get there. Was, was, was there a day when you first started acting that, that something happened you said, I can do this, I'm an actress? I think it was a bit later. I mean, in the beginning, I, I, I don't think I was even cognizant of being talented. Um, because I just simply was reacting, I guess the way a child would, because I hadn't been trained. Um, and then finally, uh, somebody told me that I should go and study with um, Jeff Corey. Um, and this is 1959, and in our acting class, because some of you are older so you understand this, in our acting class, we was in Jeff Corey's garage, and Jeff Corey was a wonderful actor who had been blacklisted and couldn't work anymore. Uh, but in the class was Jack Nicholson, Robert Blake, Bobby Driscoll, Dean Stockwell, Millie Perkins, me, a um, couple of others. I mean, it was extraordinary. Amazing, yeah, I know. <laughs> and they, we were nobodies at that point, you know. <laughs> Who do you watch today? We've been talking about Richard Burton and all the great talents he worked with. Who are the young people you see coming up that you say, you know, they're really good actors or actresses? You know, I like the 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 blonde girl. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. She's got the goods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, she's got the goods. Any actors, Tom Hanks, people like that. What did she do? Jennifer Lawrence. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what woman show is going to be great? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Let me come back here. I love this performance. I thought it was interesting, and I love the fact that the language was so clean. <laughs> what do you think about the raunchiness that a lot of the films are seem to be heading these days? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I I don't understand the pornography aspect, you know. I I wish that that I hadn't watched a Wolf of Wall Street because it, I have an image in my head that I would rather not have. Um, and I don't quite understand the reason for making that film, but you know, uh, Whatever. Um, yeah, there's a. But I think. How can I say this? I think that we have entered a culture that is very disturbing because I think it's a culture of meanness. What? Meanness. That we have, for example, all the reality shows are based on being mean. You you win you win Survivor if you're the most the meanest and the most manipulative. And if you have a eleven year old boy who doesn't want to study at school and he looks at that, he says, I don't have to study. I just have to be man able to manipulate and be mean. And all of those, whether it's 
Kardashians or whoever it is, and I'm deliberately saying the name wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely evil. Um, it, it, and all, and all, um, all the housewives of, you know, uh, all Bob's the, the housewives of Bob's Springs. The housewives of everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but they're all mean to each other. And, and I just, that I find really kind of scary. I think, I mean, I'm just about positive that there are only two groups of people that are really happy at the moment. And that's sociologists and comedians. Because <laughs> those sociologists just say, oh my God. Honestly, am I right? It's like they gotta be deliriously happy. <laughs> Looking back at your career, I know this is a cliche question, but is there any role you turned down that after you know it came out and oh, fell on stage? Stupid? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. They shoot horses, don't they? Oh, you turn that down. Well, yeah, and to be oh. fair to me. Right. Yeah. To me. <laughs> we want to be fair to you. We love you. I was pregnant. Oh. Oh. Uh, and they said they would wait, and then I thought, well, my God, that's not fair to my daughter. You know, I've got to hang around a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned that down. That was really fun. That's it. And your last question? Take one more, okay? Mm -hmm. this, I'm coming to the orange show. He's been, he's been asked. Oh, this guy. All right. So um, you were very young when you were nominated for two Academy Awards for plays by William Inge and Tennessee Williams. Had you seen the plays before you did the movie? No. And did you ever get a chance to play Heavenly on stage? No. No? Okay. Yeah. No, but I, I, I play Blanche and I, you know, other other things of Tennessee's, and I of course knew him, and he wrote a play for me, and and I, I loved him so much, and uh, I, I thought it was interesting. I thought well, answering your question about when did I decide to do this, I think that because the first thing I did. Um, was William Inges, and he's from Kansas. And um, uh, years later, I, I started a festival in Kansas about 35 years ago. It's still going. It's the William Inge Festival, and we honor a playwright every year. Um, so he's very much in my heart. I didn't know him very well. I met him. Uh, and when I met him on the set, actually, of uh, Dark at the Top of the Stairs, he said, you look like you could be a girl from Kansas. And I said, I am. Yeah. Um, he was huge. He was, like, so intimidating. Um, I'm like Tennessee, he was, like, warm and fuzzy. <laughs> well, we have to wrap this up, so I just want to say for everybody, we've so enjoyed you. Oh, and you have such a wonderful career.